This is Apollo Control. It's 75 hours into the mission. Apollo 11 is 2,241 nautical miles away from the moon. Velocity 5,512 feet per second. We're 41 minutes away from loss of signal as Apollo 11 goes behind the moon. We're 49 minutes away from the lunar orbit insertion maneuver number one. Welcome to the lunar orbit insertion episode of the Race Aerospace commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. The crew of Apollo 11 entered the moon's sphere of influence, where the moon's gravity is more dominant than the Earth's gravity, at 61 hours, 39 minutes, and 55 seconds. However, because the sun has been on the opposite side of the moon, all the astronauts have been able to see is a black disk covering the stars and, as the sun was directly behind the moon, a glinting edge. Now they are only 49 minutes away from the burn point at their closest approach to the moon, where they will capture into orbit around the moon using their service propulsion system for nearly 6 minutes. That will slow them down from about 2,400 meters per second, or 5,400 miles an hour, to just above 1,600 meters per second, or 3,600 miles an hour. At that speed, the moon's gravity is strong enough to keep the spacecraft in a tight orbit. When leaving the moon and returning to Earth, they will have to increase their speed by the same amount, roughly 1,800 miles an hour, or 800 meters per second, that they decrease it during this burn. During this lunar orbit insertion, referred to by the astronauts as LOI, I'll start a brief history of space flights up to this point, which will continue through the lunar landing video. I'll introduce each space mission, and then there will be a brief cinematic in honor of it that will roughly depict the events of the mission set to music. Most of this video will be dedicated to the activities of the astronauts, though. I'll just be filling in some minor gaps in their activities. This history of spaceflight will continue in the next video, which will include a TV transmission from the astronauts, and then there will be a few videos which I will not comment during, and where the astronauts are packing up for their first night around the moon and then sleeping. I'll resume at hour 99 with preparations for landing, and the actual lunar landing in hour 102. Just a reminder of two other acronyms that will come up a lot during the orbits around the moon, AOS and LOS. AOS stands for Acquisition of Signal, and LOS is Loss of Signal. Every time the spacecraft goes on the side of the moon that does not face Earth, there will be a loss of signal. Lunar orbit insertion occurs out of contact with Earth because of the nature of the approach to the moon. So mission control will be extremely tense as they await word from the spacecraft, which will occur about 20 minutes after the end of the burn. The start of lunar descent will also happen out of contact with Earth because the landing itself occurs at a location directly facing Earth and the most efficient place to do maneuvers to prepare for landing is on the opposite side of the moon from the landing location, with the distance essentially giving the spacecraft more leverage and the moon's gravity acting as a fulcrum point. Apollo 11, this is Houston. We observed your gimbal test down here and it looked good to us, over. Roger, look good here. In talking about events leading up to the Apollo 11 lunar landing, there are many places in the story we could start, but I want to focus on the actual space launches that set things in motion or tested critical techniques or hardware. And the first of those is the first successful orbital launch of them all, Sputnik 1. It was a simple 84 kg satellite containing basic communication equipment launched on October 4th, 1957, a little less than 12 years before Apollo 11. Sergei Korolev, the Soviet chief rocket designer, had made his R-7 rocket capable of launching far more than an 84kg satellite. The R-7 had originally been meant as an intercontinental ballistic missile, capable of delivering nuclear warheads to the United States, but Korolev had always meant for it to launch the first person into space. It was a very large rocket, weighing in at 267 tons on the launch pad, and a variant of it is still launching cosmonauts and astronauts into space today. To demonstrate its capabilities, the real satellite Korolev had wanted to launch was called Object D. Weighing in at one ton, it had an array of scientific instruments and would also demonstrate the feasibility of using the rocket for sending a person to space if an upper stage was added to it. But Object D could not be ready in time and the Soviets were concerned that the United States was getting close to being the first to launch a satellite. President Eisenhower had announced in 1955 that the United States would aim to launch something into orbit as part of the International Geophysical Year 
which stretched from July of 1957 to December 1958, and so the simple, unassuming Sputnik was prepared. Object D would be launched as Sputnik 3 seven months later. With that, here's a Kerbal Space Program simulation of the launch of Sputnik 1 set to music. The Soviet Union quickly followed up with a second satellite launch. Sputnik 2 was sent up less than a month after Sputnik 1 on November 3, 1957, but it carried a more significant payload, the dog Laika. Laika became the first animal to reach orbit on this mission, but unfortunately no provision was made to bring Laika back down safely. Laika and her container were about 508 kilograms, so still lighter than Object D. She was provided with a week of water, oxygen, and food pellets but the craft was not properly protected from the heat, and she died in a few hours from that. While Sputnik 1 had sparked awe around the world and some fear in the West, Sputnik 2 brought criticism of the treatment of Laika and regret on the part of Soviet engineers that they hadn't tried to build a re-entry system. Still, Sputnik 2 clearly signaled the start of the race to put the first human into space.
The United States did not have a 267-ton rocket at its disposal yet. Instead, its first satellites were launched by Werner von Braun's 29-ton Juno-1, which put Explorer 1 into orbit on February 1st, 1958, and the 10-ton Vanguard rocket from the Navy, which put Vanguard 1 into orbit on March 17th. Explorer 1 discovered the Van Allen radiation belts, being launched into a much higher orbit than Sputnik 1 thanks to it being only 14 kilograms despite having scientific instruments. Vanguard 1 was even tinier at just 1.47 kilograms and was more of a Sputnik 1 type of deal with just communication equipment. Vanguard 1 is the oldest artificial object still in orbit.
This is Apollo Control. It's 75 hours, 15 minutes into the mission. Apollo 11's distance from the moon now is 1,516 nautical miles, 1,516 nautical miles. Velocity, 5,981 feet per second. By the way, despite being tiny, Vanguard 1 also marked its own first, the first satellite powered by solar cells. So the Soviet Union had launched two satellites, and the US had launched two. The United States was next with Explorer 3, which made better measurements of the Van Allen belts, and then Korolev finally got to launch Object D, which became Sputnik 3. Weighing in at 1,327 kilograms, it was nearly a thousand times the mass of Vanguard 1 and a hundred times the mass of Explorer 1, marking the clear early lead the Soviets had thanks to the R-7 family of rockets. It had an array of instruments to measure pressure, cosmic rays, magnetic fields, micrometeorites, and the composition of the atmosphere, which while tenuous, still has some particles up at the altitude where a stable orbit can be reached. In enough time, a spacecraft in orbit will experience enough drag from the faint traces of the atmosphere to be brought down. Sputnik 1 came down in three months, Laika's Sputnik 2 in five months, Explorer 1 in its higher orbit in 12 years, while Vanguard 1 is expected to stay in orbit until the year 2240. Sputnik 3 was also supposed to measure the radiation belts, but it wasn't able to do so because of a recording instrument failure. The space radiation environment was of intense interest right from the start, and both the United States and the Soviet Union got a great deal of data before committing to send humans into space and to the moon. As it turned out, crewed spacecraft were much better at blocking the radiation than initially expected, as eventually seen from Gemini 10's dip into the inner radiation belt. Sputnik 3 was launched on May 15, 1958. Apollo 11, this is Houston, radio check, over. Flat clear. Roger, and uh, your systems are looking good from down here. Yeah, let's get up here too, Bruce. Pioneer 1, launched on October 11, 1958, was the first spacecraft launched by NASA, which officially opened its doors on October 1, 1958, after it was established by a bill signed on July 29th. NASA was the successor to NACA, or NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which had started in 1915 to handle research into air travel. NASA basically added space research to the same mandate. Pioneer 1's ambitious goal was not only to pass by the moon, but also to become the first lunar orbiter. And it failed. In lunar orbit, its mass would have been 23 kilograms. Instead, it was stranded in a very high orbit with a peak at 113,800 kilometers, a third of the distance to the moon, but only 100 meters per second or roughly 200 miles an hour shy of the velocity needed to get to the moon. It failed because the second stage of its rocket cut out early, but it did achieve heights that no other satellite had achieved before, 
And of course, it was the first attempt by any space agency to reach the moon and make orbit around the moon. Which is of course what Apollo 11 is going to do in about half an hour. Early space efforts were fraught with failures, so a mission like Pioneer 1, even though it didn't achieve its intended mission, is still sort of a partial success. Consider that its predecessor, Pioneer 0, was destroyed in a launcher failure, as was Pioneer 2. In 1958, the Soviet Union logged one successful orbital launch and four failures, while the United States had far more launches, 23 because of its smaller rockets, and scored five successes, 16 failures, and two partial failures. Either way, the record at this early stage was dismal, about a 20 to 25 percent success rate. Improvements were quick in coming though, and in 1959, the next year, the success rate was up to 50 percent for both. By 1962, the Soviet Union was at 68 percent on 22 launches, while the US had an 86 percent success rate with 59 launches. Our next mission, Pioneer 3, simply sought to fly by the moon or crash into it. But it ended up in the same situation as Pioneer 1, getting in orbit with a peak at 102,360 kilometers. This time though, NASA was able to use it to measure the outer Van Allen radiation belt and also test the spacecraft's camera trigger. That trigger was photosensitive cells that would take a single photo when the light of the moon was detected. Pioneer 3 weighed in at just 5.87 kilograms.
This is Apollo Control at 75 hours 26 minutes. We're 15 minutes away from loss of signal. Apollo 11 is 966 miles from the moon. Velocity 6,511 feet per second. We're 23 minutes away from the LOI burn. With the public affairs officer telling us we're 15 minutes away from loss of signal, it seems appropriate to talk about our next historical space launch, SCORE. SCORE stands for Signal Communications by Orbital Relay Equipment, and it aimed to become the world's first communication satellite, though it would only work for 12 days. The first satellite relayed message was President Eisenhower saying, this is the President of the United States speaking, through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. My message is a simple one. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on Earth and goodwill towards men everywhere. It was a very weak signal from the satellite, though, so only very good equipment could receive the message. Like Leica's capsule, the equipment for SCORE was built into the core stage of the rocket and didn't separate. Flight Director Cliff Charlesworth polling the flight controllers for the go no go status for LOI now. In theory, at this point, if a flight controller saw something wrong with the Apollo 11 spacecraft, they could give a no go for orbit, and the spacecraft would continue on its free return trajectory back towards the Earth, likely requiring some further course adjustment. Of course, if they were to do that, they better have a very good reason to do so. Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Roger, go ahead, Houston, Apollo 11. Uh, 11, this is Houston. Uh, you are go for LOI, over. Roger, go for LOI, Houston, Apollo 11. And we're showing about uh, 10 minutes and 30 seconds to LOS. I uh, would like to remind you to enable the BD roll on the auto RCS switches, over. Roger, and uh, confirm you want uh, PCM low going... Uh over the hill, over. That's uh, affirmative, 11. Roger.
That was Buzz Aldrin confirming the go. Uh, if you want, I'll put it back to high until just before uh, LOS, over. Uh, negative 11, low is okay for now, over. Roger. For our final historical mission before the astronauts make orbit around the moon, which will begin in about 17 minutes, we will discuss the very first mission to enter the sphere of influence of the moon, fly by the moon, and ultimately reach orbit around the moon, Luna 1. The Soviet Union launched Luna 1 on January 2, 1959 on an R-7 rocket that now included an upper stage. This new rocket was called Luna, after its first intended payload. Luna 1 was supposed to impact the moon, but the new upper stage burned a bit too long, which resulted in a flyby of the moon at a distance of 5,995 kilometers. That was a fortunate error, because it led Luna 1 to become the first artificial object sent out of Earth's sphere of influence, making it a tiny artificial planet around the Sun. Given this special place in history, it has also been given the name Michta, which means dream in Russian. It has a mass of 361 kilograms, and orbits the sun every 450 days. For the next 40 minutes or so, we'll have pretty continuous audio from the astronauts. For the long coast period on the way to the moon, they didn't really do any onboard recording after docking with the LEM, after the translunar injection burn, because they had good communications with Earth. But now, they'll record anything they feel is important when they're out of communication with mission control, including this lunar orbit insertion. The audio is not of as good quality as the PAO loop, and I'll provide images of the official transcripts to help with understanding what they're saying. So, I hope you'll enjoy this segment, and also feel some sympathy for the people in Mission Control, who had no idea whether or not something horrible had happened when the astronauts tried to light the massive engine on their tail. The PAO may never sound so enthusiastic as when they get AOS on the other side. Time check, please. Roger. I give you a uh, mark at 13 minutes and 30 seconds to ignition. Okay. And then, uh, and then a GET, please. No, stand by a minute.
I'll give you a, a time hack on a GET at 75 hours, 37 minutes, and I'll try to bias it about a second and a half to allow for the time of flight. Okay. Stand by. Mark, 75 hours, 37 minutes, GET. Thank you. And uh, I'll give you a time hack on the time to ignition uh, at 12 minutes to ignition. Over. Okay. Stand by for a mark at TIG minus 12. Mark, TIG minus 12. Yeah, we're right on, Bruce. Thank you. Roger out. We're three minutes away from loss of signal. Apollo 11 is 425 nautical miles from the moon. Velocity 7,368 feet per second. Weight 96,012 pounds. Two minutes to LOS. Okay, 4 one minute to Apollo 11, this is Houston. All your systems are looking good going around the corner. We'll see you on the other side, over. Okay, up here. Roger out. Nine minutes. Signal as Apollo 
11 goes behind the moon. We were showing a distance to the moon of 309 nautical miles at LOS, velocity 7,664 feet per second. Weight uh, was 96,012 pounds. We're seven minutes, 45 seconds away from the LOI for one burn, which will take place behind the moon out of communication. Okay, DVC Turbo Power 1, AC1. DVC Turbo Power 1, AC1. 2 to AC2. Here in the control center, uh, two, two. two members of the backup crew, Bill Anders, Jim Lovell, have joined Bruce McCandless at the uh, Capcom console. Now Fred Hayes, the third member of the backup crew, uh, has just come in too, and Deke Slate, director of flight crew operations, is at that console. The viewing room is filling up uh, among those we've noticed on the front row in the viewing room uh, are astronauts. Tom Stafford, John Glenn, Gene Cernan, Dave Scott, Al Worden, and Jack Swigert. Time check. Okay, we've got six and a half. With a good uh, lunar orbit insertion burn, the Madrid station should acquire Apollo 11 at 76 hours, 15 minutes, 29 seconds. Acquisition time for no burn, 76 hours, 5 minutes, 30 seconds.
Back up and yak up. Three minutes. Three minutes. Station control power direct, two of them to main A, main B. Rotational control power direct, main A, main B. SDS helium valves, verified auto. Level four, limit cycle off. Okay. SDIHL 50-15. All right. Stand by for two minutes. We'll have Delta V thrust B on there. Okay. That's right. You already asked them that, they said turn it on in two minutes. They never saw any lights, and they never saw a signal, so yes, I say let's do it. Put it on two minutes and be ready to turn it off. Okay. I'll be ready. Coming up on two minutes. Mark, gone, nothing happened. Translation controller on. Okay, rotation controller on. Okay. Tape oh, recorder. Drift it off a little bit. Pressure than they were predicting. Yeah. You know, 
Cutterman will be the best people. Minus 6.8 on the Delta V to be. All right, no knowing residual. EMS function is off. Is that that Yeah. Okay, okay. Stand by and off on EMS. What else you got, Buzz? I haven't got that. EMS mode, stand by? Stand by. BMAC mode, 3 to rate 2? 3 to rate 2. At that band max? At that band max. You see him, that's right. What? Big lens or small one? 
Oh, really matter. 80 millimeters probably is good for For the year. earth coming up? Oh, oh for the earth, earth coming up, we want 250. That takes some, Not sure really get the some luck to get that. Yeah. It doesn't matter, we got two hours on that stage. They don't care if you run out. As long as you're on bit rate low. Okay, infinity. Uh, lap 11. Okay, let me get my well, let me get my gouge out here. I got my gouge. Uh, I might want to back off a half stop to get the earth. But, are you uh, you black and white or color? Uh, Alrighty. Moon distance five six. First distance eleven. Here's Terminator. Hey. Which way are you uh, maneuvering oh. there, friend? Five six at a five six at one two fifty. Are you rolling? Rolling. You are, I'm rolling right. Well, there is some rough country over there. You might get it coming sideways here. Stand by in case it does. What's the AOS time? It was uh, fifteen with a burn. 1523, something like that. Just be with you in 10 seconds now. I just want to get my. Uh, we ought to be able to get it. Put, put back together here. Couple of good cuts. There, it's going to be over here. ALS 7615. That's the call. If you got the safe vectors transferred, I'll do that. Now, what else we got? Coming up there. Eyeballing and chattering. You got the burn status report? That's all ready to give. Okay, that looks good. Give me a verb uh, 64. Anybody got a Kleenex? Uh, yeah, I think I've got one. Oh. Here's one that's a little moist, though. We'll stand by. Well, one more fiddle and burn. Two more. <coughs> You got two more. Yeah. Right. Look at those craters in a row. You see them right, going right out there? Oh, yeah. Look at that line up. Oh, that's a, Something really peppered that one. There's a lot less uh, variation in color than I uh, would have thought, you know, looking down. Yeah, but when you look down there and say it's brownish color? Sure. Oh, God, hey, let me have that camera back. There's a huge, magnificent crater over here. I wish there the other lens on, but... God, that's a big beauty. You want to look at that guy, Neil? Yeah, I see him. He's yeah. coming your way. Oh, that's our spot. Oh, let me... Here, let me... Let me. Well, there's no doubt that uh, this is a little smaller than the Earth when you yeah. look at that curvature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where is that dark spot? Dark spot right up here. You want to get the other lens on? Yeah. Don't you want to get the Earth coming up? We're past be, uh, the nine no burn acquisition time now, and we have received no signal. Don't miss that first yeah, one. How you doing? Yeah, right. Sorry, we don't need we need to catch it about 10 and earth. Dude, you're going to have plenty of passes. Yeah, right. Plenty of earth rises, I guess. Yeah, we are. Are we about there? Well, I looked at that little crater. You can probably see it right there. Yeah, that's what I was talking about just a minute ago. 
That's kind of hard to believe that that's uh, volcanic and formed by some uh, falling, isn't it? I don't it's very that. quiet here in the control room. But it's such a perfect straight line. Most of the controllers seated at their consoles, a few standing up. But very quiet. Hope none of those meteors come by right now. Let me look through the sector. Yeah. Where's the trap and earth going to be now? I'm confused. In plane, I hope. How are you doing on your roller? Well, we got about another uh, 60 degrees to go. When's ALS? Um, 15. We're seven minutes away. Okay. Seven minutes from acquisition time. Back there behind us, is it looks like a gigantic crater. Look at the mountains going around it. My gosh, they're monsters. If Apollo 11 achieved only a partial burn, we could receive a signal any any time. So we'll continue to stay up until acquisition time of 76 hours 15 minutes 29 seconds. See that real big? Yeah, there's a moose down here you just wouldn't believe. There's the biggest one yet. Yeah, it's huge. Look at his man. Just as big I can't even get in the window. And that time is the initial uh, acquisition time. It could on, take a little That's longer a to lock thing. on to the signal for voice communication. Neil? God, look at the Central Mountain Peak. Look, look, look right there. Isn't that a huge one? Look at the terrace. Did you get some pictures of that? Yeah, I just took one. You take another one here when you get around a little bit. It's fantastic. That's kind of a foggy window. That's a horrible window. It's too bad that you're too this. Oh, boy, you could spend uh, a lifetime just geologizing that one crater alone. You know that? Good. Not how I'd like to spend my lifetime, but let's do that. Beautiful. Now there's a big mother over here too. Come on now, Buzz. Don't even bring on this big mother. It's giving some scientific name. <laughs> yeah, it sure looks like a lot of them have slumped down. A slumping big mother, right? You see yeah. that guy once in a while. Most of them are slumping. Four minutes away now. The bigger they are, the more they slump. That's a truism, isn't it? <laughs> that is, the older they get. No. 
Well, we're at 180 degrees. Uh... And now we're going to want to stop that and start a slow pitch down. We want to go. Well, down. You're not going to see the earth uh, come up over the horizon. 70 degrees. Is it pitch down or pitch up? It's down. It's so we're looking forward. Down. So we're looking forward. All right. I wonder what kind of a rate. You got four score. minutes to get there. All right. You never make it. There are a few conversations taking place here in the control room, but not very many. Uh, most of the people sitting quietly, watching and listening, not talking. Look warm down there, Neil? I sure can't tell. It's hotter than hell to me. Well, look at the size of that one. Yeah, another picture of that big fellow. Yeah, I'm going to take one out here. I got an eight coming up, gentlemen. That's good. Jack, it's one o'clock already. Hey, you know we got a TV show. Gimbal angle to pitch to. What are we going to do on that one? Oh, I just, just send pictures in there. What did you want, Mike? A gimbal angle uh, to pitch to. To sit down 70, right? Let's see, from uh, 226 to 70 at 296. Well, that noise is just bringing up the system. We have not acquired a signal. We're a minute and a half away from uh, acquisition time. that the crew is working on the antenna angles to uh, bring the high gain antenna to bear.
out of your reach. Being loud and clear, Houston, how are you? Roger, reading you the same now. Uh, could you repeat your burn status report? We copied the uh, residuals and burn time, and that was about it. Send the whole thing again, please. It was right. It was right perfect. Delta take zero, burn time 557. Uh, CAD values on the angles. VGX minus 0.1, VGY minus 0.1, VGZ plus 0.1, no trim. Minus 6.8 on Delta PC. Fuel was uh, 38.8. Mach 39.0. Plus 50 unbalanced. We ran an increase on the pugs. Now to 44. Showed us in a 60.9 by 169.9. Roger, we copy your burn status report. And uh, the spacecraft is looking good to us on telemetry. Everything looks good up here. Uh, that burn report was by Neil Armstrong. So, Apollo 11 is now in orbit around the moon. The next major event is the first TV transmission from around the moon, which will occur in the next video. For now, the astronauts have already started getting themselves situated and appreciating the view of the lunar surface. A word about the simulated view from Kerbal Space Program, I did not reorient the spacecraft in the various ways they did for antenna reception purposes, and in general, due to the sheer length of the mission, I was generally not at the computer while I was recording. Obviously, I made sure critical events like the lunar orbit insertion burn happened correctly, but as you can see from the current view, I would surely have turned the camera to get the moon and or the earth in the shot had I been present. Anyway, let's continue with our history of spaceflight leading up to this mission. Next up is Pioneer 4, which launched on March 3rd, 1959, about a month after Luna 1. Its goal was the same as Pioneer 1 and 3, and finally, it worked. Pioneer 4 was the first American spacecraft to enter the moon's sphere of influence, but just barely, at a distance of 59,000 kilometers. At that distance, the moon was too faint to trigger a photosensitive cell on the probe, and it failed to take its photo. It did carry the usual radiation equipment, and sent information back about radiation levels beyond the radiation belts. It was just 6.1 kilograms in mass, making it 1 50th the mass of Luna 1, but its tiny 0.1 watt transmitter managed to send a signal back to Earth from a distance of a million kilometers, three times the distance to the moon. Ultimately, it joined Luna 1 in orbit around the Sun. Unfortunately, this would turn out to be the most successful U.S. lunar probe for the next five years, until NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, finally broke a losing streak with Ranger 7 in 1964.
Uh, this is Apollo Control. We're showing spacecraft weight in lunar orbit, 72,004 pounds. NASA's JPL did have success with other probes, though, and Explorer 6, launched on August 7, 1959, was one of those. It was a heftier 64.4 kilograms and had solar panels allowing it to function for a more extended mission. Its goal was to gather radiation, cosmic ray, magnetism, and micrometeorite data at both low and high Earth orbit up to an altitude of 41,900 kilometers for 60 days. It also transmitted the first photos of Earth from orbit, though they were of really low quality. It failed to deploy one of its four solar panels, and that reduced its signal-to-noise ratio, but it was still able to send back nearly a thousand hours of data. Luna 1's original goal had been to collide with the moon, but a fortuitous overburn of its transfer stage saved it from this fate. Luna 2 was not so lucky, as the Soviet Union once again tried to impact the moon, and this time, it worked. Luna 2 was launched on September 12, 1959, and became the first artificial object to come in contact with the surface of another celestial body, in this case, by crashing into it. Luna 2 featured Geiger counters, a magnetometer, micrometeorite detectors, and other radiation detectors. As with other Soviet probes, it released a cloud of sodium gas along the way for visual tracking. It impacted the moon east of the Sea of Showers, Mari Imbrium, after a quick journey of one day and 14 and a half hours. That was much faster than the approach the astronauts took, both because it could not adjust course as easily along the way, so the faster trip was more accurate, but also because it didn't have to worry about slowing down when it reached the moon. If it had wanted to make orbit around the moon, as Apollo 11 just did, the faster trip would have resulted in more fuel required to slow down. Along with its scientific payloads, Luna 2 also carried Soviet pennants that presumably smashed into the moon at a speed greater than 2,400 meters per second or more than 5,000 miles an hour. On a visit to the United States, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev gave President Eisenhower a replica of the pennants, with Pioneer 4 barely entering the lunar sphere of influence, Luna 2 demonstrated clearly that the Soviet Union had better guidance systems as well as more powerful rockets. The United States had conceded that the Soviets had the latter, but still thought American guidance systems were superior. It would not be until 1964 that the United States would have a successful lunar impactor, and that Ranger probe had nearly the same mass as Luna 2.
Apollo 11 is getting its first view of uh, the landing approach. This time we're going over the Terentius crater. And uh, the pictures and maps brought back by Apollo 8 and 10 have given us a very good uh, preview of what to look at here. Uh, looks very much like the pictures, but uh, like the difference between watching a real football game and one on TV, uh, no, no substitute for actually being there. Uh, Roger, we uh, concur, and uh, we certainly wish we could see it firsthand also. That was Neil Armstrong. We're going over uh, the Messier series of craters right at time, looking vertically down on them. And uh, Messier A, we can see uh, good-sized blocks in the bottom of the crater. Uh, I don't know what our altitude is now, but uh, that indicates those are pretty good-sized blocks. Okay, it, uh, just roughly, it looks like you're about uh, uh, 120 miles or 130 miles right now. Make that 127 miles. We're approaching uh, PDI point now over uh, Kaseki in sight. Tracking data uh, for the first few minutes shows you in a 61.6 by 169.5 orbit over. All right, sir. And Jim is smiling. Less than a month after Luna 2, the Soviet Union launched Luna 3 on the second anniversary of the launch of Sputnik. They sent it on a free return trajectory around the moon, like Apollo 11 was on before it made orbit, so that it could take photos of the far side of the moon and transmit them back. It actually used a camera from a captured American genetric spy balloon, and sent back enough images of the far side of the moon for the Soviets to compile an atlas, and name hundreds of features, some of which were confirmed by the International Astronomical Union.
Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Go ahead. Uh, 11, Houston, during your SPS burn as uh, played back uh, on tape down here, we've observed the nitrogen tank Bravo pressure in the SPS system dropping a little bit more than we anticipated. Uh, it's holding steady right now. Uh, we'll continue to watch it and keep you posted if anything comes up. Over. All right, thank you. All right, and it has held We're steady. We're going over our mass column, mass. Okay. Yeah, Boot Hill, Duke Island, uh, Sidewinder, looking at mass column W. That's the ER around uh, checkpoint. And uh, just coming into the Terminator. At uh, at the Terminator, it's uh, ash and gray. Uh, as you get farther away from the Terminator, it gets to be a lighter gray. And as you get closer to uh, the subsolar point, uh, you can definitely see browns and tans in the ground. Pretty to uh, to follow live by observation, anyway. Roger, 11, we're recording your comments for posterity. Okay. Again, that was Neil Armstrong with the report. The background of accused us of being compromisers. Houston, uh, when you have a free minute, could you give us your onboard readout of N2 tank Bravo, please? And we'd like to uh, make sure you understand that ever since you stopped thrusting with the SPS, the temperature in this tank has uh, uh, remained steady. Over. Make up the, uh, the pressure has remained steady. All right, we understand tank pressure uh, has stayed steady. Thank you. Roger, we're showing the uh, NG tank pressure and uh, tank problem to be uh, 1960, something like that, and uh, Alpha is uh, about 22, about 2250, over. Uh, Roger, we show uh, 2249 and Alpha and 1946 down here. It's worth reflecting on the fact that just two years after the launch of the first satellite to orbit, both the United States and the Soviet Union were sending probes to the moon, and the Soviets had both impacted the moon's surface and taken photos of the half of the moon never before seen by human eyes. In 1960, both countries would start trying to send probe missions to other planets. It was an incredible pace of development that would continue through the 1960s, but largely plateaued after. This is similar to the story of air travel, but on a greatly compressed timescale. With aircraft, development has been marginal since the second generation of jet airliners began to be introduced in the 1960s, and especially since the first flight of the Concorde in 1969, but the first 60 years of flight saw tremendous innovation. For spaceflight, that process was largely crunched into 12 years, thanks to massive investment from the government and large-scale dedication from industries in both the Soviet Union and the United States. The next probe of note was Pioneer 5, launched on March 11, 1960, and it was supposed to launch to Venus for a flyby of our neighboring planet, but missed its transfer window. Unlike with the Moon, which a mission can theoretically be sent to daily, travel to other planets can only take place within a few weeks every year or two. With the rapid pace of development, there was no point keeping Pioneer 5 for the next opportunity because by that time there would be a much better probe available, so instead, Pioneer 5 went to an orbit between Earth and Venus. It was 43 kilograms, and unlike in the video coming up, it was spin-stabilized. 
It had a solar particle detector, magnetometer, Geiger-Muller tube, and micrometeorite detector. It confirmed that there was a magnetic field between the Earth and Venus, and also demonstrated that it was possible to transmit data from another planet, even though it missed its chance to actually reach one. It sent data back for 50 days, and at a range of up to 36 million kilometers. When we talk about how much money was spent on space development, and people look at a mission like Apollo 11, there's often a question about whether it was worth it. In the case of Apollo 11, it drove a great number of very valuable technologies. The Apollo guidance computer was one of the first integrated circuit computers, and in general the money spent on developing electronics for spacecraft has driven miniaturization of electronics. Whereas large corporations were content with computers that took up entire rooms, that was not reasonable for a spacecraft. Apollo and its predecessor, the Gemini spacecraft, drove the development of hydrogen-oxygen fuel cells, and satellites that we have mentioned were using solar panels long before practical residential applications, crucially investing in their early development. Our next historical satellite began a benefit from spaceflight that's often neglected, weather prediction. TRS-1 was launched on April 1st, 1960, and it was the first satellite to transmit infrared images of the Earth from space, specifically for meteorological purposes. It was the first satellite to lead to accurate weather forecasts, critical for large-scale and very destructive weather phenomena like hurricanes or blizzards. TRS-1 had a mass of 122 kilograms and was operational for 78 days before suffering an electrical malfunction. At this early stage, continuous weather coverage was still years away, but the ultimate legacy of TROS-1 has been a definite reduction in hurricane deaths, as, unlike before satellite weather forecasts, people are now warned about a hurricane's approach. While communication was lost with TROS-1 on June 15, 1960, it is still in orbit.
Houston, Apollo 11. How about uh, coming up with some roll pitching your angles at which to stop this uh, so-called orb race that I'm doing? Roger, stand by. We'll have them for you in a minute, Walter. Okay, and uh, time to stop, Walter, please. Yes, indeed. The next satellite started another space legacy. Transit 1B was launched on April 13, 1960, and it was the first successful test satellite in a system known as NAVSAT, or the Navy Navigation Satellite System, the world's first operational satellite navigation system and the forerunner to GPS. Its launcher also featured a version of the AJ-10 engine in supper stage that could reignite, and this is the first time an engine restarted in space. Apollo 11 service propulsion system is a development of the AJ-10. It is technically the AJ-10-137. This is Houston, over. Roger, Houston. Uh, Roger. We show you uh, in the flight plan, uh, staying in uh, orbital rate until about 79 hours, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, do you have some particular attitude or uh, reason for wanting to go inertial, over? No, that's fine. Just want to confirm that uh, until 79.10, and we'll... Uh Ways around here in orbit. Oh, Roger. And uh, we've got an observation uh, you can make uh, if you have some time up there. There have been some uh, lunar transient events reported in the vicinity of Aristarchus. Over. Roger. Uh, we just went into uh, spacecraft uh, darkness. Until then, uh, we couldn't see a thing uh, down below us, but now, uh, with Earth shine, the visibility is, uh, oh, pretty fair. Well, looking back behind me now, I can see the corona uh, from where the sun is just set. And uh, we'll get out the map and see what we can find uh, around Aristarchus. Okay, uh, Aristarchus is at uh, Tango Echo Niner on your ATO chart. It's about... Uh, 394 miles north of track. However, uh, at your present altitude, uh, which is about 167 nautical miles, uh, it ought to be uh, over, that is within view on your horizon, uh, 23 degrees north, 
47 West. And uh, you take a look and see if you see anything worth uh, noting up there. Over. Roger out. And that was Buzz Aldrin discussing the earth shine. So far, all space mission developments have neglected one important feature very relevant to the Apollo mission. What about bringing stuff back from space? Well, the CIA had been trying to launch a probe capable of taking photos of the Soviet Union and returning the film back to the surface in a small capsule. They had made 12 failed attempts, but on the 13th try, the test capsule finally made it back. Discoverer 13 was launched on August 10, 1960, and it didn't carry a functional camera system, it was just a test of the return system. It was brought down by its retro rockets on a steep trajectory and splashed down in the ocean close to Honolulu, where helicopters were able to retrieve it. It just barely got the record for the first spacecraft retrieved from orbit though. The Soviets had been working on something much more ambitious, testing the first spacecraft that would carry a human to orbit. Corabel Sputnik 1, the first test of it that made orbit, failed to deorbit as planned. The next try, Caraval Sputnik 2, was launched nine days after Discoverer 13, and it would work. So Discoverer 13 just squeaked in as the first artificial object recovered from orbit. It was a remarkable testament to persistence after the 12 failures, but a bittersweet one as the Soviet Union would soon demonstrate the ability to send a person with a camera to orbit and return that person safely to the surface. If you could give us a, um, 
time of crossing 45 west. Uh, say again, please, uh, 11. be crossing 45 west at uh, 770410 or about uh, 40 seconds from now over 30 seconds from now to get on the Charlie from you and update my last uh, that uh, 7704 was the time when uh, Aristarchus should become visible over your horizon uh, 7712 is uh, point of closest approach south of it over okay that sounds better because we're just just went by Copernicus a little bit ago all uh, right we show you at about 27 degrees longitude right now Houston, when a star sets up here, uh, there's just no doubt about it. One instant it's there, and the next instant it's just completely gone. Roger, we copy.
Apollo 11, this is Houston. We request you select Omni Charlie at this time. Over. Okay, going to Omni Charlie. Roger that. This is Houston, go ahead. Roger, it seems to me that uh, we uh, know orbit so precisely, and know where the stars are so precisely, and you can time the setting of a star uh, or a planet to a very fine degree that uh, this might be a pretty good means of uh, measuring the altitude of the horizon. Roger.
11, uh, I'm looking up at the same area now, and uh, it does seem to be uh, reflecting some of the uh, earth shine. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, it would work out to be about zero phase to, uh, well, at least there's one wall of the crater that seems to be more illuminated than the others, and that one, uh, if I'm lining up with the earth correctly, it does seem to uh, put it about a zero phase. Houston, uh, can you discern any difference in color of the illumination? And uh, is that an inner or an outer wall of the crater? Over. Right, that's an inner wall of the crater. No, it doesn't appear to be any color involved in it, Bruce. Uh, Roger, you say inner wall, would that be the uh, inner edge of the northern surface? Well, I guess it would be the, uh, the inner part of the uh, west north west uh, part. The, uh, the part that uh, would be more nearly normal uh, if you were looking at it from the earth. Eleven Houston, have you used the uh, monocular on this? Over. Stand by, one.
Apollo 11 will be in acquisition for another 20 minutes during its first revolution of the moon. And here is the launch of Caravel Sputnik 2, the first space flight to send animals to orbit, specifically the dogs Belka and Strelka, 40 mice and 2 rats, and bring them back down safely. It was the first successful test of the Vostok spacecraft, which would launch Yuri Gagarin to orbit. Houston, we're targeting or planning to uh, make the LOI 2 burn now using uh, Bank A only. Uh, we'll have the pad and everything for you next time around. Just trying to economize a little on Bank B. Bank B is holding, though. I right, do understand. Meanwhile, as the Soviet Union was preparing to shock the world with the launch of the first man into orbit, the United States was working on more of its small satellites that would do interesting and very lucrative things. Courier 1B launched on the third anniversary of Sputnik, October 4, 1960, and it was the world's first active repeater communication satellite. In other words, it could receive messages and then retransmit them. It was the first development on what Project SCORE had started, and primarily developed for U.S. military purposes to communicate with forces around the world. It had a capability of around 53 kilobits per second, the equivalent of a dial-up connection for one user, but this was still a significant improvement over the SCORE satellite. Unfortunately, Courier 1B failed after just 17 days, but in 1962 a very similar satellite to it called Telstar 1 would be operated by AT&T and relay the first live transatlantic television feed. Early communication satellites would help the entire world share in the events that occurred during Apollo 11.
Venera means Venus in Russian, and the Venera probes were a line of spacecraft launched by the Soviet Union that would ultimately see great success making discoveries in Venus's very hostile environment. Venera 1 was launched on February 12, 1961, and it became the first spacecraft to enter the sphere of influence of another planet, approaching at a distance of 100,000 kilometers three months after launch. Still, it was a remarkable achievement. The probe had a mass of 643.5 kilograms and it was pressurized and cooled. It was the first spacecraft capable of doing course corrections by orienting using the sun and stars, though that orientation system was probably its undoing, failing to position the spacecraft so that its dish pointed back at Earth. Later Veneras, launched in the 1970s, would actually land on Venus and send photos from the surface in the midst of 462 degrees Celsius heat and a surface air pressure 91 times that of Earth's. This is Houston, over. Go ahead. 11U. 
Houston. In order to improve the communications a little bit here, uh, we'd like to try to get you on the high gain antenna. Uh, we're recommending a pitch angle of zero. Yaw 355. I say again, 355. The uh, track switch to manual and wide beam width over. Houston, you're in. Crossing the uh, 150 West Meridian will be uh, 775005. Over. Thank you. This is Houston. We have about uh, six minutes remaining until LOS. And in order that we may configure our ground lines, uh, we'd like to know if you're still planning to have the TV up at the beginning of the next pass. Over. Roger, Houston. We'll try to have it ready. Uh, this is uh, Houston. We are inquiring if it is your plan to. Over. Uh, it never was our plan to, but it's in a fire plan, so I guess we'll do it. Houston, roger out. connection with that time on the prime meridian crossing uh, you have an orbital period now of two hours eight minutes and the three seven seconds over thank you Not yet.
Apollo 11, this is Houston. Uh, a little over two minutes to LOS. Uh, all your systems parameters and orbit are looking good from the ground. Uh, we have AOS uh, on the other side at 78-23 at 3-1. Over. Right, 78 2 3 2 one. Uh, Roger, that was 3-1 on the end. Okay. This is Apollo Control. We've had loss of signal from Apollo 11 on its first lunar revolution. We will acquire the spacecraft uh, on the next revolution at 78 hours, 23 minutes, 31 seconds. The orbital period for Apollo 11's present orbit two hours, eight minutes, 37 seconds. And as you heard, uh, we passed up to the crew information that uh, we would perform the LOI-2 burn using only bank A. The banks are uh, the drive mechanisms for the ball valves in the service propulsion system. They open and close these ball valves, and the valves uh, allow the fuel and oxidizer to flow, in, flow into the engine. They're redundant valves and redundant banks, banks A and B. There was apparently, a, they were driven by nitrogen, and that was the reference to the uh, pressure drop there. There was an apparently a leak in nitrogen tank B during the LOI-1 burn. This uh, burn was performed with both banks open. The engine can be operated with only one bank. It's apparent that the, uh, the tank leaked only while, during the burn while uh, the bank was actuated pressure has held steady since uh, the end of the burn and the experts are reducing the data and looking at the leak rate determining whether it was constant throughout uh, the burn what precisely what the uh, situation is we're showing uh, pressure in tank B of 1960 psi and tank A 2250 psi. Both of these are well above the red line of 400 pounds psi. I can get the name. 
name of the game is to go back to uh, Lee Omni. Huh? Back to Lee Omni? Well, I see. We come over the hill next time and we're supposed to have them on a high game, I think.
This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 77 oh, hours uh, 48 minutes uh, now into the flight Apollo 11. Here in uh, Mission Control Center Houston, uh, we're in the process of changing shifts. Uh, Cliff Charlesworth, uh, green team of flight controllers, uh, very shortly will be leaving their consoles. Meanwhile, Apollo 11 uh, passing uh, over the far side of the moon out of acquisition. Our uh, last orbital parameter readings uh, on our uh, flight uh, dynamics orbital digital displays indicated uh, an apogee of 168.5 nautical miles, a uh, paraloon of uh, one uh, correction, paraloon of 61.2 nautical miles. We're currently planning a change of shift briefing uh, at approximately 2.30 central daylight time or as soon thereafter as is practicable. The uh, change of shift briefing uh, will include only uh, flight director Cliff Charlesworth. Uh, it's expected to be of short duration since we will uh, have a, a TV pass uh, soon after reacquisition of the spacecraft. At uh, 77 hours uh, 50 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11, uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. To wrap up our history of early spaceflight, for this video at least, while the crew of Apollo 11 continues in orbit around the moon, it is time to honor the pivotal first flight of a human in space. Vostok 1 was launched on April 12, 1961, and it carried Yuri Gagarin, a 27-year-old pilot who was in excellent physical condition and also likable, an important quality for a person who would become the face of the Soviet space program. A week before the launch, head of cosmonaut training Nikolai Kamenin was still undecided about whether Gagarin or Hermann Titov would get the flight. Titov was the stronger candidate, but the second mission, Vostok 2, was a much more taxing whole day mission, while Vostok 1 was a single orbit. Kamenin opted to have Titov handle the more difficult mission. That said, both cosmonauts were at the top of the selection process, so Gagarin was not somehow less capable. Vostok followed a long series of Karabal Sputnik tests, which included dongs as well as mannequins named Ivan Ivanovich, 
The Soviet Union was confident it was ahead of the competing American program. The lighter American rockets could conceivably send a person into space first on a short hop, but not into orbit. The testing program for Gagarin's flight had the time to be thorough, and they knew it. The American program, unlike the Soviet one, was quite public. In the end, Gagarin would be the first both in space and in orbit. Gagarin was supposed to be launched into an orbit that was low enough that orbital decay would bring his spacecraft down in 10 days if the retro rockets failed, and Gagarin had enough supplies to last those 10 days. Unfortunately, he was tossed up a little higher than expected, and it would have taken 20 days for him to come back without a retro burn. But it turned out that the retro rockets worked, so all was well there. It was a rough ride back down, he experienced around 10 Gs, and because the impact of the capsule on the ground was deemed too rough, Gagarin had to eject out of the spacecraft at 7 kilometers altitude and parachute down himself. Because of the unexpected orbit, he had landed 2,800 kilometers from the planned area and was met by a frightened farmer and her daughter. The rest, as they say, is history.
That'll do it for me in this video, though there's still about a minute left of Apollo 11 floating serenely in orbit around the moon. In the next video, we'll continue with historical space missions, though fewer than in this video, because there will be a substantial television broadcast by the crew capturing views of the moon, so don't miss that. Thank you for watching the Rays Aerospace commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11.